recording. So you are the presenter now. So you can share your screen. Should I do that now already? Yeah, yeah. So we make sure that everything works fine again. Okay, there, there, there you are. Okay. Is that working? So, um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have uh, Professor Andrew Mitchell here with us today. Professor Mitchell got his bachelor's in 2005 at Oxford, uh, his PhD also at Oxford in 2010, and then he did three postdocs from 2010 to 2016 at the uh, University of Cologne, at Oxford, and Utrecht in the Netherlands. And since 2016, he's an assistant professor at the University College uh, Dublin, UCD. And since 2021, he's the director of the Center for Quantum Engineering, Science and, and Technologies, EQUEST. And today he's going to talk to us about quantum simulation of exotic impurity models using non-electronic circuits. So, Professor uh, Mitchell, it's uh, a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thanks a lot for this invitation. Um, I've actually been following along uh, this series of seminars for, for a long time now. Um, so this semester is actually clashing a bit with my teaching, but I've been catching up with the, with the, the YouTube channel. So that, that's been a really great uh, series of seminars and I'm, I'm very glad to be a part of it today. <clears throat> um, yep, so I'm from uh, UCD in Dublin, Ireland. Um, as George mentioned, I'm also the director of this Sequest Center. This is our quantum technologies center here. And just a little bit of advertisement there, I guess. Um, we're always looking for good students and potential postdocs. So um, if you'd like to come and work with us, then please get in touch and we'll, we'll see how we can uh, put an application together. Um, so the work I'm gonna talk about uh, is sort of related to some of these figures you see on the screen here. Uh, in the middle is this nano electronics device that I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. And on the right is uh, um, a sort of conductance plot measured from the experiment. And on the left is the theory, which agrees pretty nicely. So I want to sort of explain where all that comes from and what the aim of all of this is. And this material is contained in these two archive papers that I've mentioned there. Um, the experimental work has just been accepted for publication. So hopefully that'll appear any time now. Uh, I should also acknowledge um, <clears throat> the fantastic work of my collaborators, uh, in particular, the experimental nanoscience group of David, Hol David Goldhaber Gordon in Stanford. Um, that was involved in the first paper there. And uh, also of uh, Christoph Mora and his group in CNRS Paris uh, on the, some of the, the more theoretical aspects, which I'll talk about uh, in the second part. Okay, so on the menu today, first of all, I want to give a rather long and uh, basic fun introduction, I guess, to analog simulation uh, in general. Uh, and this will be sort of a, a lighthearted uh, introduction, I guess, to the whole field. Uh, and then we'll sort of change gears a little bit and move to uh, the idea of quantum simulation with circuits, nanoelectronic circuits in particular, and the specific kind of devices that I've been interested in in recent years, which are these so-called charge condo quantum dots. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about uh, the sort of marriage between theory and experiment and sort of validating some of the basic components that could form these potential quantum simulators of the future. So I, I like to call this the simulating of the simulators. So we need to sort of validate these things by simulating what's going on in the simulators. Uh, and finally, I'll talk a little bit about some of the um, non-trivial physics that arises in these systems, in particular, the fractionalization at quantum critical points. Okay, so I want to start off with this sort of uh, light uh, introduction to analog computers. So analog computers um, have been around for more than 2,000 years, actually, believe it or not. So um, first of all, I want to 
tell you a little bit about this thing called the Antikythera mechanism, if you've not heard of it. So this was um, a 2000, more than 2000 year old artifact uh, discovered uh, in 1901 in a shipwreck off one of the Greek islands. Um, in 1902, it was already noticed that this ancient artifact has uh, gears inside it, some of the first gears, of course, ever to be uh, observed in anything. And, um, but it was only in, actually in 2008 when um, people, scientists started doing X-ray tomography on these ancient artifacts that they re revealed that this device uh, has an incredibly complicated set of 37 interconnected gears inside this thing. Uh, some of them are very, very precise with more than 60 teeth uh, engineered to precision. And there's a set of dials on the front and the back of this device. So through this sort of intricate clockwork mechanism, um, this is, I'll show you here a video uh, of the uh, X-ray tomography here, which actually shows that you can see as you sort of scan through the device, all of these like interlocking gears and so on. So this is actually a really sophisticated piece of kit. So this, in, through this uh, intricate clockwork mechanism, uh, you can actually make in very, very accurate astronomical predictions. You basically crank the handle of this device, uh, the dials turn, and they show the orbits and the relative positions of the five planets that were known to the ancient Greeks at the time, as well as predicting solar eclipses decades in advance, uh, even the dates of the predecessor of the Olympic Games and that kind of thing. Um, so this is highly accurate calculation, so actually modeling basically the motion of the solar system. And this is a kind of computer. Um, it's one that works sort of by physical moving parts that represent the motions of the planets and the moons. And it calculates by analogy rather than by abstraction. So we actually have sort of relative sizes of the cogs and the gears in this device, uh, sort of representing the relative diameters of the orbits of, of the entities in the solar system. The motions of the certain dials are analogous to the motions of the sun and the moon and so on. So this is the first known computer, uh, and it's an analog computer. Obviously, it's a, a thousands of years before the advent of digital computers, and it's tailored to a particular task. Um, it's more powerful because it's tailored to a specific task than anything that was actually possible at that time by any other means. So this is a really sort of remarkable device, an analog computer, if you like. And so here I've shown some uh, figures here of the, the, the dials in this system. You can see that the motions of the planets and so on can be predicted. And there's all sorts of complicated things on the right hand side that are predicted by this, by this device of interlocking gears. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce another um, example, fast forward a little bit to illustrate other aspects of these analog computers. So fast forward to the 19th century, so an important problem faced at the time and actually faced by man for thousands of years has been trying to predict the tides. Um, so this is critical to fishing and navigation at sea. So sailors, of course, routinely need to avoid the low tides to avoid running aground to get their ships into port. Um, so it turns out that predicting the tides is extremely complicated. So you've got to work out the sort of timing and the magnitude of the tides and this varies from time to time, but also uh, it varies from place to place, actually a highly complex problem. So in the 17th century already, Laplace understood that the tides are driven by a few astronomical frequencies. Um, so you need to actually know 10 or so of these different uh, effects. Um, for example, the positions of the moon and the sun, the eccentricity, lunar orbit, and, and so on. There's about 10 or so factors you need to know in order to make accurate predictions about, uh, about the tide. So each of these contributes essentially a sine wave, which is what I've showed here on the right-hand side of the figure. Uh, and the sine wave has a particular frequency, amplitude, and phase. So it's basically to work out the tides, you need to sum up these different Fourier modes. So the tides can be predicted 
um, if you know these frequencies and if you know these modes and you know how to combine them to get the overall response signal. Um, so I'll play this video and you can see that all of these different components have to be uh, somehow added up. And Lord Kelvin in 1872 had this great idea of automating this process, coming up essentially with an analog computer to combine the contributions of these different waves. So the idea he had was basically, um, if you had a knowledge of all of these different uh, sine wave components, you could build a device that sort of physically operates with the uh, motion of these, uh, of these cogs with offset centers um, with a rope dangling around from one to the other, which will then reproduce the, uh, reproduce the signal. And this is this device, a uh, physical device that was actually built and used for um, almost a hundred years actually to predict the tides um, in London. Um, so here again, the idea is that you're basically cranking a handle. It's a mechanical analog of sine wave addition. Um, but this is actually not the most complicated problem. Um, more complicated than that is how do you actually find what these different um, uh, component, these Fourier components are. So that's the inverse problem of taking the signal that you can, uh, that you can measure and finding out the components is um, obviously equivalent to doing a Fourier integral and that's much more difficult. Certainly in 1872, there was no computers to, to do that. Um, and so uh, uh, Lord Kelvin basically tried to figure out a way to build a physical computer that could do this Fourier decomposition. Um, so he wanted a mechanical integrator that could take the measured signal of the tides and work out um, these different modes. So if you've not seen this before, I think this is a truly amazing device. Um, so we, what he developed is this idea of a ball that it sits on a rotating disc and due to this rotation of the disc, the further the ball moves out from the center, the faster it spins. And at the center, it doesn't spin at all. And if it moves onto the other side, it rotates the other way and so on. So the motion of this ball is then converted into an output um, by basically attaching it to a roller. So the roller then keeps track of how fast the ball is, uh, is spinning and it moves a pen up and down on this output vapor. So the idea is that you trace a function you want to integrate uh, with a stylus, and this moves the uh, ball up and down on the disc, and hence controls the speed of rotation, which is then transferred through the roller to the output, which actually plots the integral of the original function. Um, but this is not what you want to do for a Fourier integral, of course. You need to multiply it by a sine wave of a particular uh, frequency uh, and then integrate it. And Lord Kelvin worked out that all you have to do to mimic this is to rotate the disc backwards and forwards at that frequency. So it's a really amazing physical device that he made, which is able to basically do these Fourier integrals mechanically rather than on a computer. Okay, so we learn a few things from this introduction of um, these analog computers. First of all, you can actually do really powerful computation by building a physical device these are specific to a particular problem. These are not all purpose computers. They do just one thing. Um, we also see that you require an enormous amount of ingenuity, I guess you could say, in the design of these things. Like to come up with these ideas to build a physical device that does a Fourier integral is, I mean, it's nothing short of genius, I think. So you need quite a bit of ingenuity to figure out how to build these analog computers that do a specific job. Um, you also need to build a physical device, and that requires um, precision engineering to make it work. And finally, in order to know that you're actually doing the right thing, you certainly need to build a model of the device that's operating and validate the results that you expect to get before moving into realms of computation that are beyond any other means. And so I guess that's a long winded introduction to the idea um, of analog computers, uh, which I want to talk about today in the modern context. Of course, since uh, 
the Antikythera device, and since Lord Kelvin's Fourier integrator, uh, we of course now have modern computers, which are universal. That means they're all purpose and programmable. You abstract the problem that you want to solve, and basically any problem can be coded up. I should say any problem that can be uh, mathematically well posed can be coded up onto the computer. And this um, provides a way of solving a much wider range of problems. It's not like you need to build a specific computer for a specific problem. Um, digital formulation also provides a robustness against errors because it's inherently sort of discretized, if you like, with the zeros and ones of the output. Um, so within classical computation, of course, I know you all know this, um, but the exponential speed up that we saw in the last few decades uh, in classical computation that was achieved through miniaturization, otherwise known as Moore's law, um, is certainly an, at an end because with this race to the nanoscale, now we have um, <clears throat> transistor sizes in our chips that are just a few nanometers in size and they can't get any smaller because it's already at the quantum scale. It's really amazing testament to sort of technological achievement that starting in the 1970s from the first Intel 404 chip um, down to today's chips, we've really reduced the transistor size by uh, really more, more than a factor of a thousand, which is incredible. Um, so obviously computing power has increased exponentially, uh, although that's now at an end, uh, and now it has ended, some problems, of course, remain intractable. And um, so those kinds of problems are ones where, of course, you have an exponential scaling and they're not going to be solved by classical computers. And um, one idea, given that we've now developed this capacity to go down onto the nanoscale is to exploit quantum properties to solve quantum problems. And um, with this, with this race to the nanoscale has come our ability to control systems uh, with ex exquisite um, in situ control uh, on the nanoscale and build quantum devices and really have control over the, the quantum properties. Um, so the idea is to basically build these nanoscale components and integrate them into electronic circuits. Um, and these quantum devices have quantum properties. The quantum properties show up, for example, in electronic transport through these devices. So in the, the top right here is shown a micrograph image of one of these quantum dot devices built in a semiconductor. So this is something that's lithographically defined in a semiconductor heterostructure. So you have to sort of etch these things on almost by hand, these uh, electrodes that I show there. Um, and I just want to comment that actually in the 25 or so years since that first device was made, actually from the Gold Harbor Gordon Group, um, now people are actually leveraging commercial CMOS technology to make quantum dots like actually in uh, computer chips. So there is a, a spin out company in my university, UCD, uh, called Equal One Labs, and they're actually using commercial CMOS processes to build arrays of quantum dots. Uh, actually in computer chips and do cool them down with integrated electronics and actually do quantum experiments uh, in a computer chip. Remarkable. Um, so the idea is perhaps that we can uh, use these quantum properties to help us do computation. But of course, there's a catch, which is that there's no universal quantum computer yet. Put an asterisk there. Some people would argue that there are some universal computers available, but um, it's not like they have uh, such great power that they can solve all the problems that we want. We're far from that. And so the idea actually is as an intermediate step to do analog quantum computation, where you can use quantum hardware to solve problems by building an analog of the thing you want to build, but using exploiting the quantum properties. Um, in particular, a class of hard problems that we might want to solve of a special interest, of course, to us in the natural sciences is to solve uh, quantum mechanics problems. So, for example, we might want to understand the properties of quantum materials and uh, quantum matter in general. And 
actually doing those simulations on a classical computer is a famously very difficult problem. And although scientists have uh, come up with incredibly ingenious uh, computational techniques uh, for, for actually getting some way to finding solutions to uh, many body quantum problems, um, it's not like there's a generic all purpose solution to all the questions that we might have. <clears throat> so an idea might be to build an analog computer that solves quantum problems by using quantum components. So similar to the Antikythera device where you have an analogy of the solar system in the gears, maybe we can have a, a quantum device that builds an analogy of the model that we want to solve with quantum components. And one um, class of those are so-called quantum impurity problems, where you have some few localized interacting quantum degrees of freedom coupled to one or more baths of conduction electrons. And it's been known for a while now that nanoelectronics devices of the sort that I show here on the screen and talked about on the previous slide um, are actually very good analog quantum simulators of these fundamental quantum impurity models. So one can imagine the quantum dots in these systems as being our quantum impurity, and they're con connected by electrodes at quantum point contacts into bulk metallic leads. Uh, and these are, provide basically the, the bath of conduction electrons. And one can write down models for these systems and perform the experiments. And it's been shown time and time again that there's um, a fantastic quantitative agreement between theory and experiment uh, for quantum impurity problems and quantum dot devices. The nice thing about quantum dot devices is that you can tune them in situ, you can build all sorts of interesting um, structures. Uh, and in them at low temperatures, you can see a fascinating range of correlated electron physics. A few of them are listed here at the bottom of the screen. Coulomb blockade, Condor effect, all sorts of quantum interference and many body quantum interference effects, quantum criticality, and all of the good stuff that comes with that. So a way of studying these problems um, can be to build these devices and to probe them. As an example, um, although we have a good understanding of many quantum purity problems at e equilibrium, the non-equilibrium problem is extremely difficult. Um, but of course, you can operate these physical quantum nanoelectronics devices at finite bias with equal ease and get solutions to problems uh, that would be very hard to obtain by classical computation. Uh, more recently, um, people have been really pushing the boundaries with analog simulation of certain lattice models using arrays of quantum dots. So here are some uh, excellent recent examples where using just a few quantum dots um, in a nanoelectronics device, aiming to capture the essence of certain physical properties that would occur in bulk lattice systems. For example, a sort of cluster realization of the Fermi Hubbard model, Heisenberg chains, and even seeing the emergence of Nagaoka ferromagnetism in, uh, in these four quantum dot plaquettes. Um, so this is taking a step towards thinking about simulating properties of materials um, by sort of controlling in a very detailed way the properties of these quantum dots on a nanoscale. However, there are some problems with this approach for nanoelectronic systems because it's very difficult to actually scale these systems up. One of the main problems, actually, it turns out on a practical and engineering level is trying to get each of these quantum dots to be identical and individually addressable and coupled in a, uh, in, in a precisely controllable way to its neighbors. Um, that's because the quantum dots are small and they have a discrete spectrum. And it's very difficult to control the details of that spectrum and make them exactly identical from quantum dot to quantum dot. And that has hindered sort of scaling this up to simulations of, of correlated lattices, which is, I guess, one of the main open problems that people wish to investigate with these kind of nanoelectronics quantum simulators. So I'd like to talk about a promising paradigm, um, which might overcome some of those problems. 
So these are so-called charge condo circuits. Um, there's been a few recent works on this, both on the experiments and the theory side. And this is based on Matveyev's uh, paradigm. This is uh, really fantastic theoretical work. And then the experimental work building on that is also truly remarkable. So the idea basically is you start off with a large metallic grain or a large quantum dot or an island connected to two or more leads. And if we assume the electrons are spinless, meaning in practice, put on a large magnetic field to polarize the spins, um, then we can get some interesting effects. So in particular, um, because the quantum dot uh, is large, it hosts a large number of electrons, but it is still of finite size and has a finite capacitance and therefore a finite charging energy. And by tuning the gate voltages, one can imagine trapping a certain number of electrons on this large quantum dot. And by tuning the gate voltages, you could bring into degeneracy um, many body states on the dot with n electrons and n plus one electrons. All the other states, because of the finite charging energy, would be higher in energy uh, and at low temperatures could be neglected. And so you basically can regard the two charging states, n and n plus one electrons, as a charge pseudo spin, as I've indicated here. So you can imagine n electrons as a down and n plus one electrons as an up. Remember, the actual physical electrons are basically spin polarized, but we regard these two collective macroscopic charge states as a charge pseudo spin. Okay, but these are not in complete isolation because we connect this quantum dot to metallic electrodes. This is micrograph image of the first one of these charge condo dots that was built. You can see that it's actually a hybrid metal semiconductor device. And we have a couple of leads here. There's actually three leads shown in here, but let's just talk about two of them. And there's a metal component on this large dot, which provides this large, uh, macroscopically large number of electrons on the dot. So um, the Hamiltonian that I've written there, H, uh, involves these four uh, reservoirs, if you like. There's electrons uh, on the lead or on the dot around each of the two quantum point contacts. So the quantum point contacts are labeled alpha, one or two, and the electrons can either be on the lead or the island, L or I. And we have a bath of non-attracting conduction electrons. Um, but those things can be attached to the leads and the electrons can tunnel at the QPCs. So imagining that I have N electrons on the island initially, when I tunnel an electron from the lead onto the dot, it increases the number of electrons and it basically flips that charge pseudospin from a down to an up. So that corresponds to a tunneling process from the lead to the dot, but also with this sort of raising operator S plus for the charge pseudospin on the, on the dot. And likewise, I can move an electron from the dot onto the other lead, and that corresponds to a lowering of the charge pseudospin because the number of electrons on there is changing. And also correlated to that spin flip, um, an electron is tunneling from the dot to the lead. And altogether, this Hamiltonian is identical to an, an anisotropic version of a multi-channel condo model. So this is one of the fundamental um, quantum impurity models uh, which is a classic paradigm for strong electron correlations. Uh, and this was studied in these papers um, that I mentioned at the bottom of the screen there, uh, experimentally. So what's seen in these systems um, is a frustration of condo screening, which gives rise to uh, the phenomenon of quantum criticality. So in the first of the papers, uh, experimental papers, this one on the left here, um, they looked at the situation with a single dot coupled to two leads, and they looked at the renormalized conductance or transmission, if you like, of each of the quantum point contacts, which is plotted on the horizontal and vertical axis there. And um, they set the system up with a particular bare transmission for each of the QPCs, and then lower the temperature, and that produces sort of flow, if you like, of the relative transmissions, um, which is what's plotted here as the arrows. So you see these arrows consist of a bunch of points. They're going down in temperature. 
So you can set the system up with a bunch of different starting parameters um, for the initial uh, transmission for each of the two point contacts, and then you can follow down in temperature, and then you can plot those and you get something that looks like an RG flow diagram. So remarkably, you see that there's sort of a flow towards different fixed points. And there's a sort of separatrix between these two behaviors along the diagonal there, which is this frustrated condition. So if you've got the coupling to both of the leads is exactly the same, then you seem to flow at low temperatures to um, a particular unusual point that's uh, unlike being anywhere else in the phase diagram. On the right-hand side is a more complicated version. This is where we have a single dot connected to three leads, and two of them have the same coupling, but we're varying the third one. We see now there's an even richer phase diagram, if you like. You can see the different flows um, of these renormalized QPC transmissions towards these different fixed points. Um, really beautiful experiments, really uncovering uh, this fundamental idea of renormalization group flow that one sees in these quantum dot devices. Okay, so where are we in terms of the theory though? And how do we understand these devices? In what sense are these quantum simulators? So one of the things that we need to do, as I mentioned at the beginning, is to sort of validate our model that we might have of a particular simulator. So we need to, we need to know what a particular device is simulating for it to be of any use. And therefore, um, what we would like to do is build a model of our simulator. And in certain limits, we'd like to do um, highly accurate um, theoretical calculations of the predicted behavior of this device and compare it with the experiment to validate that it's indeed working as expected. This was done for the systems, and this is work that I was involved with. Um, and what's plotted here is the conductance through these charge condo devices for two leads on the left-hand side and for three leads on the right-hand side along these critical lines. And this frustration of condo effects, which means that they can't form a condo singlet state simultaneously with each of the leads, gives rise to critical behavior. And this gives rise in turn to a very distinctive flow of the conductance or let's say a very distinctive conductance line shape as a function of temperature. In fact, one expects universal scaling of the conductance with temperature uh, when rescaled in terms of this emergent scale TK. And this is something that we can predict from the quantum impurity models. So if we believe that these models really describe these devices, then we should be able to make quantitative predictions about the conductance in them and compare it to the experimental observation. And in these very beautiful experiments, we can see that as we vary the transmission, the bare transmission of the QPCs, we're actually changing the TK, we're actually not changing the temperature, we're changing the TK, and therefore the T over TK uh, can be plotted. And it agrees perfectly over many orders of magnitude in T over TK with a theoretical prediction. So this is a, a really nice um, confirmation that these devices are actually faithfully simulating these quantum impurity type models, uh, both from the two channel uh, situation and in the three channel situation with, uh, with equal ease, if you like. The, the, bo both of those uh, are providing quantitative agreement between theory and experiment. So, Sorry, Andrew. Andrew. Yep. Uh, a question. Uh, these, uh, the data that are collapsed there are from the previous slides. So the, the data from the experiment are collapsed in the, in the, or are the calculations that are collapsed in the. Yeah, so the, it's the, it, it's the, okay. So th these are actually two different papers you can see here. There's yeah. one on the left is two channel, one on the right is three channel. So these mm -hmm. are, there was improved, improved theory and improved experiment in the second of the two papers. And the data I'm showing here is from the second of those papers. Okay. Uh, what, they, what they did is um, for each value of the bare transmission through the QPCs, that's the tau value that's plotted and that's shown in the middle of, of the page here. Okay. Um, 
they worked out, or they, they measured, I should say, they measured the conductance through the device uh, at different temperatures. So if you look at a given color of the points on the left, for example, you'll see uh -huh. there's like four or five different points. They're at mm -hmm. progressively lowering temperature. And um, for each of those, they can basically deduce the condo temperature TK. And then knowing the physical system temperature T, they can then plot the, those points on, in the rescaled way T over TK. And by doing that, they sort of, for all of these different uh, tau values, which correspond to different TK values, they can assemble this universal curve. So that, that universal curve is something you can get from the experiment. And then that can then be compared to the theoretical universal curve for the conductance okay. of the function T over TK. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. So the um, the black line is the theory curve. That's obtained by um, the numerical renormalization group method, um, which I know many people in the audience know something about. So I won't say much more about that here, other than that it's the gold, in my view, the gold standard method of choice for numerically solving uh, quantum impurity problems and obtaining such things, uh, some di such dynamical properties, such as the conductance as, as shown here. Um, so this is linear response, and we use the Kubo formula to obtain it, which relates uh, the conductance to a current current correlation function, which you can calculate within the NRG method. And it's a bit of hard work to do this with progressively more and more channels, but we were able to do that also for the three channel case on the right hand side. And again, produce this lovely uh, universal curve onto which the experimental data fall rather neatly. Okay, so these, uh, I want to sort of advertise, I guess, these hybrid metal semiconductor components. So here we have a, se a semiconductor um, where we put spin polarize the electrons um, so they're actually operating in the quantum Hall regime. I didn't mention that, but that allows for these very, very um, pristine, if you like, chiral edge channels, which have a very well controlled transmission across the QPCs. Um, and then there's this metallic component on the middle, which provides this large density of states um, for, the, for the quantum dot, uh, providing basically a bath of electrons on the dot itself. So these systems really provide excellent in-situ control um, of all of the parameters that you might want to control in your model, which is something good if you want to do simulation. Um, Condo type models are directly realized in these systems. So this is an interesting theoretical point. So here there's like no underlying Anderson model and we're taking a condo limit, it's nothing like that. The tunneling through the QPCs causes a pseudo spin flip directly. And so we sort of directly realize in our simulation, in our sort of physical analog simulation, we directly realize a condo type model, which is somewhat unusual. And one of the, um, uh, one of the sort of features of, of that mapping is that the condo coupling in the model J is related to the QPC transmission tau, which can be large. So normally when you think of a quantum dot, realizing a condo type model, the J is perturbatively small. Not true in this case. That means that the J can be large, the TK can be large, and therefore you can reveal all this beautiful critical physics um, at high temperatures, high enough that they can all be seen at experimental base temperatures, for example, which is why, of course, we could get these beautiful scaling curves that I showed you on the previous slide. Um, another feature is that these dots host uh, continuum density of states, essentially. They have this blob of metal sitting on there. So they don't have a discrete spectrum with this large energy spacing as one would have for these super small uh, quantum dots that we're used to. These metal, these hybrid metal, metal semiconductor dots have uh, a continuum density of states, which means that as long as you make these dots the same size, roughly, they're nominally identical. It means that you can make lots of these dots and couple them together and they'll all behave exactly identically. And I'll show you precisely that that's working in, in, in the next section. But just to say here, this gives us a, um, a route, if you like, to scaling up these systems to potentially simulating uh, lattices. Um, one thing we need to do though, um, as we saw here, I guess, was that you can validate these models by 
quantitatively precise agreement between theory and experiment. But there's one thing yet not done, which is that we need to, if we're going to scale this up, we need to think about connecting two of these dots together at the very least, thinking about um, what the interaction between those two is and uh, making sure that these two dots are actually identical, they behave in an identical way, that's what we'll need for scaling up to the lattice. So we want to check the kind of interactions that exist, we want to check that the dots are nominally identical. And so that's um, what we wanted to do. In order to scale up to lattices, we need identical dots. We also want to think about a wider range of potential couplings between the dots. And this is the next section. Um, which is this new paper um, that I want to mainly advertise, I guess, in this talk, which is uh, this collaborative work with David Goldhaber Gordon's uh, experimental nanoscience group. And they built this double dot device. So this is the first one of these uh, charge condo circuits to involve two such coupled dots. And we were able to show that this is a variant of the famous two impurity condo model. So this is a non-trivial variant that I'll explain now. It has a Hamiltonian that looks sort of similar to the kind of condo model I showed you before. Now we have two dots. So we have a coupling of one dot to the, the left dot to the left lead. We have a coupling of the right dot to the right lead through these spin charge pseudo spin flip terms. But then we have this new ingredient which is the coupling between the two dots. So in the usual two impurity model, we would just have an exchange coupling, like an S plus S minus type term between the two dots. But here, because electrons are physically tunneling at the QPC, which connects the two dots, we actually have a kind of correlated spin flip tunneling between the two dots, which has this rather peculiar term that I've highlighted here. And it's, so therefore, one can realize a rich range of different kinds of coupling interactions in these charge condo dots. And it's what we want to do here is explore the consequences of this and try to understand what one sees in the experiment. So what they do in the experiment is to plot the conductance through the device, the series conductance, as a function of the gate voltages that can be applied to the left dot or the right dot. So UL here on the vertical axis is uh, the potential applied to the left dot you are on the horizontal axis is a potential applied to the right dot. And for different combinations, you obtain different conductances and you obtain at the experimental base temperature of 20 millikelvin, um, this hexagonal uh, structure of the charge stability diagram. And you can see that there are regions where there's low conductance, there's regions of enhanced conductance, and then there are these bright spots, which are special. Um, using the model that I, showed on the previous page, um, and by fitting carefully the parameters of that model to the experiment, um, we were able to do NRG calculations for the conductance, uh, which is plotted here. It's actually on the same scale uh, of conductance and of gate voltage, and it basically agrees perfectly. Um, so this is a triumph, I think, on both the experimental side and the theoretical side, that not only uh, do we have a good um, model for the device, we understand the coupling interactions, but also that the theory and the computation, the classical computation is under control in this regime. Of course, one of the nice things you can do with classical computation from the theory side um, is simply go to lower temperatures. You can't do that in the experiment, but we can see, for example, here that at low temperatures, this structure really sharpens up uh, and we see these bright points that I mentioned earlier really stand out from the uh, suppressed conductance background. So I'll try to explain why that is now. So it turns out that these bright spots in this uh, charge stability diagram are uh, special points. Um, they're actually quantum critical points, as I'll tell you momentarily. Um, but one thing we can do from the experiment is see that there are different regions with low conductance. These are regions where you basically have a conserved number of electrons on the two dots. Imagine they have n electrons on the left dot and m electrons on the right dot. These are macroscopically large, by the way, so I'll just leave them as n and m unknown for now. But as I go from one of these hexagons to the other, I know that I'm adding and removing electrons. So I can sort of navigate around in this diagram uh, thinking about which regions uh, have stable charge 
um, configurations. And at one of these bright spots, you can see that it's at the degenerate intersection between three of these regimes, N and M, let's call that state A, N plus one and M, let's call that state B, and N and M plus one, let's call that state C. So at one of these bright stop spots, it's, it's called a triple point in the diagram, it's where the three of these states are, three of these charge configurations are degenerate. Now that would be in the isolated case of just the, the pair of dots, but what we're interested in, of course, is connecting these uh, together and also connecting them to the leads. So instead of now having a condo impurity with just two charge states in the double dot, we have this ability to go to a triple point where we have three degenerate states. So what's the consequences of that? Interestingly, these three states that I've called A, B, and C can be interconverted by the three uh, transmissions at the three quantum point contacts in the system. So I have this JL term which connects the left dot to the left lead. It converts A to B, tunneling an electron from the lead onto the dot, onto the left dot. We have JR which converts state A to C by tunneling electron from the right lead to the right dot. And then I can take an electron from the left dot and put it on the right dot, not involving the leads, and that involves the transmission of an electron I can take an electron from the left dot and put it in the right dot. <clears throat> I can take an electron from the right dot and put it in the right lead. <clears throat> so you can see here that we start and end um, in state A with N electrons, uh, N and M electrons on the left and right dots. Um, but we're able to take the electron all the way from the left lead to the right lead. Um, so this is a process um, a conductance process uh, where uh, the electrons are sort of transmitted from one lead to the other through these different charge configurations. So that's why actually that- um, is... uh, Andrew, sorry. Uh, your camera is off and you are not sharing the screen anymore. Uh, okay. Yes, something happened and you froze a little bit. At least I saw you frozen and okay. then your camera disappeared and, uh, okay, you are back, your camera is back and uh, you are, you have to share, yeah, sharing the screen, okay. Okay, is it working again now? Yeah, yeah, and you are back to the same slide, yeah, okay. Okay, let me okay. go back a little then. Um, yeah, so the idea is that at one of these triple points, I can transfer an electron from the left lead to the left up. A goes to B, from the left dot to the right dot, that's B goes to C, and from the right dot to the right lead, C goes back to A, and so we kind of return back to our initial configuration, we kind of reset the device. So that's why this is a bright spot in the conductance, because I can transfer an electron from source lead to drain lead without leaving this ground state manifold of charge states. Okay, so at this point, it turns out that um, we have a quantum phase transition because of the competition between these uh, competing processes. So I can imagine the condo effect forming between the left dot and the left lead, between the right dot and the right lead, and actually an inter dot condo effect driven by this tunneling process at the middle. So from NRG, we can calculate the entropy. And what we see is that initially we have three degrees of freedom for the three charge states, log three, um, but at the critical point when all of the couplings are equal, um, we go down to a half log three, which is a weird fractional amount. It's a residual entropy, uh, which indicates that this is a non-Fermi liquid situation. Uh, we're halving the number of degrees of freedom, if you like. Uh, halving the dimension of the Hil Hilbert space would be the right way to say it. Um, also, this is the entropy that's predicted from Z3 parafermion, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment, um, time permitting. So I should just say that from the model at the critical point, we can make certain predictions and we can make a prediction about what the conductance should be at this triple point. And we find that it's exactly a third of, um, of the, the conductance quantum E squared over three H. And there's a very distinctive conductance line shape as a function of T over TK 
uh, on flowing to the critical point. But also we can go at the critical point and we can perturb, for example, by moving away from that triple point in gate voltage space. This is a relevant perturbation drives you away uh, from a high conductance to a low conductance. Uh, that's moving away from this bright spot in the diagram. And again, that has a universal characteristic shape. This is something we predict from the theory. And we'd like to validate that our experiment is actually operating in this regime uh, and is faithfully capturing and simulating the, the model. And so we are able to show from the experimental data that this scaling collapse as we move away from the triple point causing the conductance to reduce in this characteristic universal way, we're able to show um, uh, that for different combinations of temperatures and different combinations of tunnelings uh, at the QPCs, that these fall onto the, the universal theory curve. Um, so this gives us um, hope that this device uh, really is simulating this fundamental quantum purity model, we see that we actually get new kinds of coupling interactions uh, that are possible in these devices over regular quantum dots. Um, and we wouldn't be seeing this critical point if it wasn't for that physics. Also, um, both of these two quantum dots are identical, basically identical. Uh, again, we wouldn't be seeing this critical point if these two dots weren't nominally uh, equivalent. So this gives us good hopes that we can scale this up uh, and simulate interesting physics on the lattice. Okay, so maybe, Adam, do I have a couple more minutes to talk about this uh, sure, analytic sure. solution? Or shall I wrap it up there? I can I can stop there if you like. No, no, that's fine. You can go ahead. Okay, so maybe I'll, um, yeah, if you can in indulge me with a few more minutes of your time, I'll tell you about some analytic work we did. This is in collaboration with uh, Christoph Mora in uh, CNRS Paris, and we wanted to understand a little bit more about what this uh, critical point in this two-site charge condo device was. Um, so a, a common method to understand analytically what's going on in these quantum impurity problems uh, at critical points is to use this so-called emery kibbleson mapping. So this involves taking the conduction electrons of the system and uh, bosonizing them, so writing them as uh, the exponential of bosonic fields uh, phi. And then you take chiral combinations of these, in this case of the up and down spin states. These up and down spin states, remember, are the sort of localization of the electrons on lead or dot around the QPCs. And we do that, we can do this for the QPC uh, around the left uh, lead, around the right lead and at the central QPC that connects the two dots. And uh, in that way, we can actually write down the electronic spin operators in terms of these bosonic fields. And those electronic spin operators are the things that appear in our model. So this is a standard kind of mapping that one can use to uh, try to understand quantum impurity models. Uh, and what happens is the conduction electron, the free conduction electron part could be written in a rather simple way. And the remaining terms um, are transformed uh, in, in, into, into, this, uh, into this form involving these bosonic fields, phi L, phi R, and phi C. Now, in the case of, for example, the two channel conduit model, famously what happens when you do this emery kibbleson mapping is that you can go to a special limit called the Toulouse limit, um, where the interaction term basically drops out and you end up with a non-interacting model that you can then solve. And interestingly, in the two-channel case, uh, the effective particles that you have in the system are Majorana fermions rather than regular fermions. So it shows that there's a fractionalization at the critical point there to Majoranas. So we were interested to know if something similar can be done for this uh, to impure, this generalized two impurity model that we have. So doing the emery kibbleson mapping, you get the following Hamiltonian. Okay, what progress can we make with this? Um, following the same logic, we can go to the Toulouse point. So the idea here is that you deform the original Hamiltonian by adding some RG irrelevant terms to it that basically don't matter, but you can choose them in such a way that to simplify the problem, make certain uh, terms you don't want to see drop out. 
So we identified a Toulouse point in this uh, two sites charge condo system, uh, which allows us to take a particular linear combination of these uh, bosonic fields, which I'm calling phi A here, um, and it simplifies the model. So now we see that all of these terms can now be sort of factorized into this single uh, component. Um, the nice thing about this um, is that we can now understand the uh, origin of the parafermions in this system that I, that I mentioned earlier. In particular, if I take the uh, couplings to be equal, which is what happens at the frustrated critical points, JL equals JR equals JC. If I go back there, you can see these are the, co these are the coefficients of those three terms in the square brackets. The SL, SR, and SL plus SR minus terms, they are the things that are interconverting my three degenerate states, A, B, and C. And I can encode that using this object sigma, which basically just cyclically permutes the three states, A, B, and C in my degenerate manifold of charge states. So the Hamiltonian looks nice and simple in this way. Now, the nice thing is that I can um, write down another object, which I'm calling here sigma primed, uh, which just mathematically follows in this way. Um, and this is another kind of combination of these A, B, and C states, if you like. And the sigma and the sigma primed obey these Z3 parafermion properties. So if I cube them, I get one, both sigma and sigma primed, and they have these kind of generalized commutation relations that I've written there. So sigma and sigma primed are, can be written, like, if you like, they're, they're parafermions. There's two of them in the system and they, they're parafermionic modes. Okay, so we're not finished yet because this model, of course, is um, a, a very complicated model. What we can do is rotate our basis and write the whole thing, this emery kivelson point in the, following, in the following way. So what we see by doing this rotation, this is the final step, is um, this model actually becomes three decoupled copies of the so-called boundary sign Gordon model, where each of these copies are just related to each other by a sort of uh, two pi by three uh, shift of this, of this phase angle. Uh, okay, so in the end, what do we end up with? Our model that we had at this Toulouse point turns out to be basically the boundary sign Gordon model. That's a highly non-trivial uh, interacting model. You can't just, uh, it's not just like a free fermion problem like with the Majorana resonant level in the two-channel condo case, but it has been solved. So this is actually a solved problem by the beta Ansatz method. And the beta transact method shows that for the boundary sign Gordon model I've written down here, you can write it in terms of these two parafermions, and one of the two is screened. This sigma primes that I wrote down is kind of condo screened, if you like. What that means is the other one, sigma, is left free. We're kind of halving the dimensionality of the Hilbert space. We started off with log three, we end up with a half log three. The Bay Transat solution shows us that we have a change in the, the entropy of a half log three, which is exactly the change in the entropy that we see at the critical point um, of our condo system. Um, okay, so that's basically it. We were able to show, um, I guess, with an explicit construction using the Emery Kivelson method that, okay, we don't get a non interacting model at the end of it, but it is still a solvable model. And it does actually show us that we have a, a, a parafermion in the system, Z3 parafermion. Okay, so let me just wrap up. I apologize for being five minutes over time already. Um, I guess what I wanted to say here was that nanoelectronic circuits comprising these charge condo quantum dots are really beautiful systems. They're highly tunable. They provide a versatile platform. Um, in the single dot case, you get this beautiful multi-channel condo physics. You have exquisite experimental control over this and precise um, agreement with our theoretical calculations, which are fully under control. Uh, in double dots, we have a richer range of interactions. These allow us to realize novel quantum critical points that have never been observed before, both experimentally and theoretically, and indeed see this fractionalization to these Z3 parafermions in a, in a real system that's been already realized in the lab. Uh, of course, all of this is, I guess, like within the program of trying to validate 
these simple systems and simple components. And ultimately, the idea is to scale this up and to connect these different dots in, into clusters or lattices, and then be able to perform analog quantum computation, which is beyond the capability of current classical computers. Okay, thank you very much. I'll leave it there. Thank you, Andrew, for this very nice and didactic uh, talk. So it's open to questions now. Uh, do, we have, do we have any questions? Anyone raising uh, his hand or her hand? Uh, I have I have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, when uh, how how did you? Uh, did the experimentalists, uh, because you, you showed the uh, the energy results and the experimental results, the first comparison you showed there, and it's perfect, same scale and everything. Uh, did, the, did the experimentalists give you the all the parameters of the model? They said, well, the uh, J is this and and that, or did you do a fit, yeah. uh, or did you need to do a fitting? I don't think it's possible to do a fitting with the uh, with NRG, right? Yeah. So I mean, with so what we get from okay. So in this comparison, the the double dot is more complicated. In in this single dot case that I'm showing here, um, what we get from the NRG is is the universal curve. I mean, it's really one. There's a single parameter which is tk okay and okay a single parameter a single parameter scaling and there's no there's no scaling of the y-axis it goes up to e squared upon h uh, in the left and it goes up to uh, two-thirds e squared upon h on the right hand side and it's as a function of t over tk now there is a bit it's a bit of a matter of taste as to how you define what tk is but that's mm -hmm. just a sort of shift on the the on the y uh, on the x-axis here the the subtlety and there is a subtlety there always is of course the subtlety is how you rescale different data data sets from the experiment so for one particular set of data let's say in a particular tau i can of course scale it horiz horizontally to fit onto the universal curve mm -hmm. um but you kind of want an independent way for each data set of working out the tk to sort of assemble them here onto a universal curve. So they had a protocol for that, the experimentalists. They, um, they had an idea about how, as I'm changing the temperature from one, I should overlap with the data of the next one. And then you can sort of construct the whole curve in that way. I mean, you could also imagine just saying, well, let's just take each, each set of, each independent set of experimental data and shift it horizontally until it fits onto, until one of the points, let's say, fits okay. onto the um onto the universal curve and then see do the other points as a function of temperature then also fall onto the universal curve and you can see that that works rather well in the in the cases as presented here yeah so there's, not, there's in the universal cases there's not too much um yeah there's there's, there's not really too, too much to go wrong in that sense now in the double dot case there's okay. been many, many more things uh, involved. Um, so mm -hmm. first of all, uh, I mean, to, so to, for example, to achieve this level of comparison that's shown here, we really had to fit a lot of different parameters. So th this involved doing lots of NRG calculations and trying to work out, like, if I change the interaction, the local interaction on, on the dots, how do the triple points split? If I okay. change the okay. capacitive interaction, how does the size of these hexagons change? So um, there was a lot of guessing, right? There, there, was, there was quite a bit of fitting to achieve to, to achieve this simulation data. So I would regard this figure here as as a, like a simulation of the experiment. So an another feature that I didn't mention of this is that the condo model involves two charge states per dot, but to get a really good, accurate description of the experiment. At, the temp at these temperatures, you actually need to include more than just two charge states per dot. And so okay. we actually had to, we had to generalize the model a bit. And that, okay. involved, that involved having a charging energy for each dot, working out what the, 
what the charging energy was, how many states do you need to keep? So there was a bunch of things that needed to be um, tuned and fit to achieve this level of uh, agreement. I mean, the fact that you can do it, I think, is pr proof that the generalized model is the correct one to describe the experiment in this regime. But if you go to the universal regime of the critical point, which is just as considering the sort of detailed behavior around um, around the uh, around the triple point, then we, the fact that we see scaling collapse here, it's the same kind of argument as before. So we're here we're just plotting this in this kind of universal form T star upon T. And the fact mm. that the data, the fact that the data scales on top of this so so neatly, uh, does does provide strong evidence that the that the experiment at least is able to capture part of this universal physics. So okay. again, here there's no there's no scaling parameters basically. There it's universal. Okay, okay. So uh, Luis uh, wants to ask a question. Is there audio? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi, Andrew. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, very, very beautiful talk, actually. And these are, I mean, amazing results. Uh, I, I, I actually have a, a, a question regarding, you know, either the, the three parafermion on the double charge Kono model or the three channel or even the Majorana, the Majorana living in the two channel uh, condo fixed point uh so what what's your view on on trying to use these excitations as you know building blocks for say braiding operations or things like that so can can we characterize them as topological bound states in the same way that you know they are ex excitations in say fractional quantum hall plateaus are fractional non-abelian anions mm -hmm. Can we? I mean, are 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 can can you make a one-to-one -one mapping from one to the other? That's really good. yeah. So that's an excellent question. Um, I think there's a number of things to unpack there. So may, maybe maybe the easiest one to answer is: Are these useful for quantum computation? Yeah, uh, I think the answer there is just immediately no. Um, these are not topological in the sense that they're protected by symmetries. These parafermions that arise here arise from the frustration of condo screening. So they arise at an unstable critical point. So they're kind of the opposite yeah, of topological yeah. in the sense that they're fine tuned. So if I introduce, I mean, that's what this story is, well, this, that's what this story is all about, right? So, if I introduce a relevant perturbation, for example, I move away from the triple point, or I detune the couplings between of the three QPCs, I will generate an RG flow away from the critical point to a Fermi liquid state where the parafermion is gone. So it's fine tuned in that sense. So the idea of using this for, you know, making lots of them and then using it for manipulating them and using it for computation um, sounds a bit far-fetched to me. On the other hand, I think it would be possible, it, potentially you could imagine um, doing some uh, braiding experiment. Let's say you had three, so here we looked at two dots, but I'm sure it's possible to, uh, to scale this up as, as I mentioned. Imagine you had three dots and you were able to realize two of these fractionalized particles within the three dots. That's a sort of simpler structure you need in order to shuffle them around and do a braiding operation. And I think that's something that would be feasible. I mean, you'd need to be very careful about moving the things without destroying them, but I think you could do that. I think they would, I think they do have the non-trivial exchange statistics and braiding properties. Yeah, okay. I think they're not topological in that in that sense, but I think they do have the, the correct exchange statistics. Yeah. That'd be nice, I mean. They have the control, right? They, they could even do some experiment that you you've kind of fake the braiding and but still have still measure the the exchange statistics somehow. So, right? Yeah, very very. Right. very I mean, nice. there's yeah. 
but there's there's a, there's certainly different possibilities there. I mean, I think I mean these systems are so nicely controllable and you know well characterized by now. Um, I think there is quite some room to do stuff here. I mean, I think one of the nice. I mean, you, you mentioned of course fractional quantum hall. I mean, that's the other uh, well known area where you would realize uh, parafermionic degrees of freedom. But um, you know, here it's something where we have really have a physical device, an electronics device, where we are very confident that we've realized these these mm -hmm. particles and they're sort of controllable and manipulable. Um, and, you know, in the end, we have this con explicit construction of these parafermionic modes. So that's actually very rare. I mean, there's very, very, very few situations where you can make an explicit construction for these parafermions from from them you know and relate these operators to the original degrees of freedom of your problem and that's fundamentally because par parafermions can't exist in a non-interacting system and yes. these kind of irreducibly strongly correlated problems are really hard to solve so i think it's quite interesting that here we have a physical system that's realized in the lab which we're confident really hosts parafermions i think that's an achievement yeah very nice. Sorry, I was off. Yeah, I was off. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Well, I'm, I'm a bit curious. When you say uh, these two quantum dots are identical, could you be more, more, more explicit? Uh, you are not saying that they have exactly the same charging energy. Or they, they, they basically do or, actually. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. They do. I mean, so okay. they're, they're large. These things are quite large. I mean, okay, nanometers, the, but they're still large in, by the scale of um, of of regular semiconductor quantum dots. So mm -hmm. they, they have this blob of metal sitting on the on, on the top, and this basically gives um, a sort of continuum density of states to the thing. And just by tuning the sort of size of the quantum dots and the blob of metal that you put on, you you can, you know, you, you very accurately get the the charging energy of the things to be the same. And okay. the, the spec, I mean, you don't have like in small quantum dots, you have like a set of discrete levels. And yeah. to have, if you want to couple two of them together and you want them to be identical, you kind of need the whole spectrum to be the same all the way up. Okay. Otherwise, it kind of messes stuff up. It you get all sorts of decoherence effects and so on. But here, they don't right, you don't have that problem. I mean, you have a continuous. All you need is that the density of states is metallic, and you basically okay. have the same energy, and that's it. And um, to to answer your question specifically, the experimenters can can measure the charging energies, and to to within their measurement capability, they're the same. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is there's a regularity of this charge stability diagram that's shown here on the left. Uh, and that comes from the the fact that this it has this nice periodic structure is, is coming from the fact that the two dots have the same properties. Um, so you would get distortions to that if they were not um, the okay. same, um, if they were not nominally the same. And for example, the theory on the right hand side which matches very well, this is within the constraint that the two dots are equivalent. Furthermore, um, the critical point arises when the dots are equivalent, and we believe from the, the specific power law scaling that we see in the conductance that we have, that we do see the critical point in the experiment, and that would only happen if the two dots were equivalent. So it's saying identical, I think, is too strong, but like effectively equivalent or something like okay. that. Okay. I think is reasonable. Okay, perfect. So, um, would you um, would you agree that uh, the twisted bilayer graphene is a simulator of uh, different lattices? That when you rotate at different angles and you get those effective lattices, that could be used as as a, a simulator of lattices. Yeah. I, I think I do think that, yeah. Um, and I, I think this game is all about starting with a physical system that has an analogy to to some other system and probing one system to learn something about another system. 
think that's what at the that the concept of analog simulation is, is about okay. as a, as a motivated at the beginning uh, through the you know these astronomical predictions that you can make from these ancient devices i mean the reason the way that works is you make an analogy between the sizes of the cogs and the sizes of the planetary orbits so okay. i think okay. i think by 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 the similar vein i think you'd say if you have a, a more a super lattice structure from a from a mm -hmm. twisted eye layer system um you're sort of by analogy studying the different ladders. Mm -hmm. so I would regard mm -hmm. that as a simulation. I mean, it's a bit of a matter of taste as to how you call it, but that's how okay. It. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So, any more questions? Uh, apparently not. So, um, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, it was a, very, very nice. Your, yours was the last. Uh, uh talk of the series last but not least it was very nice thank you very much thank i'm gonna much. i'm gonna write to you soon asking for the slides which are gonna go together with the talk in our youtube channel okay that's fine okay thank you very much thank you take care. thank you bye. take care bye